It is Wednesday, 16th of May, 2024. Welcome to my God 6.0 video. No one's been more surprised than me to see this series go so far. It was never in my planning, and I've learned a lot from it. I've been taken to unexpected places, and I feel that I've really grown and evolved in a major way as a result of doing these videos and asking these big questions. It's becoming ever clearer to me with every passing week that this realm, this reality in which we find ourselves is not created for our own benefit and therefore is not the creation of a good, loving, benevolent creator, but rather all the evidence which is available to us and which is measurable, observable and repeatable through our own experiences points to the very strong, I would say, conclusion that this realm is specifically designed for pain, fear, suffering, trauma, anxiety and everything else that goes with it. We, as living sentient conscious beings, are here to generate states of said pain, fear, suffering, anxiety for the benefit of whatever entity or forces created this realm. So we are here as food sources, people refer to it as loosh energy, and the forces that control this realm get off on our suffering and actually need it in order for them to survive and thrive. That is a conclusion which anyone who is really paying attention to the evidence available to them, must arrive at if they have no belief system to defend and no ulterior motive to prop up. So clearly that's going to exclude people who adhere to one or the other of the major orthodox world religions. Whatever label you might want to put on it, if you're somebody of that persuasion, and your first instinct when listening to videos of this nature is to denounce them on the basis that they're heretical or they're blasphemous or they go against whatever particular religious code book you might happen to adhere to, then this is not going to be the video for you. This is not the channel for you. And there's no point in putting your comments down below, giving me some scripture or some passage to read or quoting some uh, excerpt from whichever holy book you uh, adhere to because I've heard it all a million times and these comments have already been posted a billion different places on the internet. Similarly, if you're someone of a more new age inspired love and light persuasion and you're going to tell me that of course there's suffering in our lives, it's all part of the rich cocktail of experiences that we must go through for our souls to develop and grow and evolve. Then similarly, you're not going to be telling me anything I've not heard before, and you're going to be wasting your breath. I've considered those points of view, and they don't stack up, because the suffering and the pain and the trauma that we all experience in our lives far outweighs the joy and the happiness. There are moments of joy and happiness in our lives, and I feel that they're afforded to us and we're allowed to undergo them to give us just enough reason to hang on in there and not seek to exit through the back door so that we can continue to generate these states of fear and pain and all the rest of it, that whatever forces lie out of sight and control this realm rely upon. So these are the conclusions that I've reached. And as I say, they are measurable. The suffering and the hardship continues in the lives of uh, myself. I'm not claiming to suffer uh, more than anyone else. Uh, I'm just pointing out that the hardships are stacking up for me in my own personal circumstances, and I'm not going to go into those because they are personal. But also so many people that I know, friends, uh, family members, affiliates, people that message in every single day and outline their personal circumstances to me. People are suffering. And it seems to be the people who are doing the most to try and alleviate suffering 
and try and make this world a better place and try to stand in right action and try to oppose evil and darkness and tyranny and all the expressions of it, they seem to be the ones who are suffering the most. Meanwhile, the normies, the NPCs, or the just straight selfish shits who don't mind trampling all over everybody else and all they care about is themselves because they're stuck in that satanic dark mindset seem to do just fine. Why could that be? Well, it's because the rules of the game in this realm are weighted in the favour of those who don't give a shit about anyone else and who go through life selfishly, just fulfilling their own ambitions and pleasures and desires and whims, and just don't give a thought about how that affects other living sentient beings. Indeed, those that uh, actively seek to harm other living sentient beings, not just humans, but other life forms as well, seem to do just fine. Don't know if you've noticed. They seem to be the ones who get ahead and uh, everything just works out swimmingly for them. Meanwhile, it's the ones who try to be good who just continue to suffer. And these dynamics just become more and more obvious with every passing week. Don't know what it is about these times. There's something changing, it seems, in the overall consciousness, but it's becoming more and more apparent that this place is set up in that way. So if you're going to try and oppose it, if you're going to try to uh, do good in this world and most notably fix it, then you're going to discover that that's an exercise in futility because this place can't be fixed because it's been coded. You can think of it as a CGI style computer simulation. If you like, you can draw an analogy with a video game. It seems to have computer code written into it just out of sight and that affects the way that physical reality is playing out, the way that our lives are manifesting, because it's what's been written in the background. So I used to think of it in terms of energy, frequency and vibration, and that's what was going on. And so very dense, low level energy expresses itself in the form of apparent physicality. And then the more you go up the scale towards love and uh, goodness and light and these things, then the lighter the energy becomes. So it expresses itself in different ways. But I'm now really starting to view it as a kind of video game made up of computer code. And it's been specifically written by whatever architect put it into place that pain, suffering, uh, hardship is what's required. Those whose expressions and behaviours in life go towards cultivating these states get rewarded through getting ahead in life. And those who try and go against it get punished and are made to suffer. So that goes a long way to explaining why good people only seem to reap a whole world of shit in exchange for trying to do the right thing, doesn't it? I want to play a clip at this point, which is going to surprise a lot of people. Surprise me when I first came across it, given the speaker in question. So let me put a disclaimer out there first by saying that I am and have never been a personal fan of Stephen Fry. Why would I? BBC lovey, an asset of the corporation, of course. This is a good example of taking the words that somebody speaks, the message that they put across and separating it from the individual, from the speaker in question. So I'm no fan of Stephen Fry. I suspect him of being many things. But the message that he put across when he was asked on an Irish RTE interview many years ago about his uh, attitude towards God and theology and spirituality is, in my view, absolutely spot on. He gave a great answer, and I would like people to just absorb the way he responded to this question and just consider the points that he makes. Let's take a listen to that. Any Christians or those of a, an alternative religious persuasion who might have made it that far in the video would have just been horrified, of course, and are probably calling me all kinds of things right now for even including that clip. Not that I care. 
not that it makes any difference to anything. I think that was a great answer. I think there were some very valid points raised. Countering that, though, some people might say, well, there is, of course, great beauty in this world. And yes, there is. I've just returned from a road trip to Scotland, my beloved spiritual homeland, it feels like. And as well as being on the mainland in some very remote parts of the highlands, I also managed to take a quick ferry trip across to the Outer Hebrides, so the islands of Lewis and Harris. And that place is absolutely full of awe-inspiring, majestic, natural beauty. And people will say, well, you know, if whatever created this realm is evil and uh, malevolent, how can there be such wonderful beauty in this world? And I have to wonder whether the beauty is there to offset all the darkness and all the horrific stuff that we know goes on. And if anyone tries to deny that this is the case, I would urge them to look into the realities of satanic ritual abuse and trauma-based mind control. Have a listen to interviews with survivors who have come out somehow of that kind of stuff and ask yourself then if this can be a realm created by a loving God which is here for our benefit and these experiences that people like that go through. An SRA survivor goes through those horrific experiences just in order to grow and evolve and take those lessons back to source. Doesn't seem very plausible to me, probably not to them either. So maybe the beauty that is in the natural world is there to give us just enough of a reason to hang on in there and keep going and continue to provide all the loose energy that is needed from us because we're like batteries to draw on that commonly held analogy. We're like sources of energy to whatever entities preside over this place. If the world were completely dark and completely horrific, then many of us, I'm sure, would be looking for a quick exit out of here. And the body count would be even higher than it is on that front. So maybe the beauty is there to give us enough hope and enough reason to believe that there's meaning to these lives or there's a reason for sticking around and continuing to do the right thing. Or could it be that the natural beauty is a remnant, a throwback to some kind of creation, some kind of reality that was here before the hijacking, the usurping took place, if that's what we're dealing with. So drawing on some previous ideas I've put forward in these videos and which came through in my recent chat with Howdy McCoskey, what if there's this sort of entity which has been referred to as a demiurge and Yeldabaoth and many other names to groups like the Cathars and the Gnostics, which somehow managed to gain control of this realm from the original god of creation. And instead, they came up with this bastardized carbon copy of it which was specifically set up to cultivate pain and suffering. If that's what we're dealing with, could the beauty that we see in the natural world be a reminder of what was there before? But then if that is the case, the question which seems to come up in every one of these videos that I do re-emerges. Where then was the original God of creation, if he, it, really was benevolent when this hijacking took place? I would refer viewers back to my previous video where I included the clip from the Acid House movie where you've got the old drunken foul-mouthed Scottish tramp in a pub in Edinburgh uh, announcing himself as God and stating that he just didn't get a fuck. So have another look at that one. Got another clip to play in a while. I just want to make the point that though these subjects that I'm dealing with can often seem very dark and it's understandable that they might leave somebody feeling quite hopeless and asking what the point is of continuing if this is the true nature of where we find ourselves. What I am discovering as I get further and further into this series, 
and I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, a lot of interviews, a lot of information of this nature in recent times, is that rather than making me more bitter and cynical, because I was bitter and cynical enough before I started all this, I'm actually finding that it's making me more compassionate and more empathetic, more caring towards others and to all living sentient beings. That could possibly be considered a surprise. But I think what's happening is I'm recognising that we're all in this together. We're all suffering in this realm together. And that's all living sentient beings. So I recognise the kinship that I have with everyone else, not the psychopathic, satanic, so-called elite ruling class, because they're the ones who are specifically, knowingly, deliberately doing the bidding of this uh, evil force, if you want to call it that, by deliberately, uh, systematically making this world a worse place and getting rewarded for it, it would seem, in very great measure. Apart from them, I'm finding common ground and common compassion with everyone else and every other living thing. So I think that's just part of this process. If you allow yourself to go all the way with it, and you allow yourself to be led to where these new discoveries take you. So that's something I'm finding. Also, I mentioned earlier that all the evidence suggests that this is a place that's been deliberately set up, coded, you might say, against our best interests. But that doesn't mean that we should do nothing to try and make it a better place. So I don't feel it can be fixed because, to use the video game analogy again, if you were playing a game which the creator of it had coded to reward you <clears throat> if you, let's say, destroyed aliens, supposing the aim of the game is to blow up as many alien spacecraft as you can, and you get rewarded every time you do that with points. Anyone of my generation might remember Space Invaders, the game in the early 80s, which was all about that. So supposing you decided at some point in the game that you didn't want to destroy aliens anymore. Actually, you just wanted to give them a big hug and invite them in for tea and crumpets. How far do you think you'd get in the game? You'd be wasting your time because the game is coded only to reward you if you blow up alien spacecraft. And trying to invite them in for tea and crumpets is an exercise in futility. So using that analogy, trying to fix this realm is also an exercise in futility. It cannot be fixed because it's not being set up to be fixed. What you can do is try and navigate your way through it, recognising that you're a part of it, whether you want to be or not, whatever method you came in by. Navigate your way through it as best you can, whilst causing as little suffering to others as you can. That seems to me to be our best chance and to constitute our best intentions. To have the most valuable experience as we work our way through this place, but the time that we need to be here through seeking to reduce suffering, recognising that we're never going to fix it. That's why nothing ever seems to get any better. Don't know if you've noticed. Doesn't matter which political system might come in in a particular region. Doesn't matter how much protest and pushback occurs to tyranny whenever it pops up in various parts of the world. And I'll address that a bit further in a moment. And most importantly, it doesn't seem to matter how much prayer is offered up to whichever god or spiritual entity somebody might believe in. This is another point which came up in my chat with Howdy. 
How many prayers do people think have been offered up over the course of human history? It's going to be trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions, whatever kind of figure we're looking at, however many zeros appear at the end of it. And all these prayers would have been asking for improved situations in the world, for peace, for joy, for happiness, for abundance. People would have been asking for wars and conflict and pain and suffering to end. People would have been praying for their loved ones, asking for improved situations. They might have a family member that's dying of cancer, for example, and they would have been asking for uh, the cancer to go away and for that person to recover. How many times do you think that individual that's been prayed for died anyway and succumbed to that disease anyway? So the prayers were all in vain, weren't they? They were pointless. Why? Because nobody's listening. Nothing is listening. Nothing that's going to make any kind of a difference. Nothing that cares about what you think and what you want anyway. So it's exercises in futility. However, having said that, I'm certainly not advocating that people become selfish shits and do whatever they want, adopt a satanic mindset, trample all over other people, don't give a shit what kind of impact their behaviours might have on other living sentient beings and on this place itself. I'm certainly not advocating that. All that's going to do is increase the suffering, increase the dense negative energy and increase the food source that these entities, these forces, whatever they may be, seem to feed off. What would counter that is people recognising that we should oppose evil and darkness and tyranny wherever we find it. If I didn't believe that, then my own actions of the past three or four years, my video output, not to mention the talks that I've given at various freedom rallies and various marches over the past three or four years, where I've been standing up against some quite obvious tyranny and the encroachment of a new world order nightmare, would have been in vain. And I don't believe they were. I still stand by all the work that I've done over the past three or four years. And as far as I'm concerned, more people should have been doing it. Because what those of us who have been getting involved have been doing is saying no to those who seek to make the world a worse place and to make our lives worse and those of our loved ones and those of our children and the next generation. So it's absolutely right and correct that we do stand up against these things. It's absolutely right and correct that when we find a method of placing obstacles in the path of this new world order juggernaut, we do it. If there's any way in which we can resist what they've got planned for us, we absolutely should. We shouldn't just throw up our arms and say, it's useless, it's futile, what's the point? I'm going off to smoke a spliff and stay in bed for the rest of the week. What's that going to achieve? It's only going to add to this world's problems. So I'm saying that the best approach that we can take, once we come to an acceptance that we were somehow tricked or conned or duped or coerced into incarnating into this place, is to seek to reduce suffering as much as we can, navigate our way through it as best we can, still seek to help others, still seek to oppose evil and darkness, and just see that as our best way through these lives. No longer falling for the mind control of religion and whatever promises various political systems might make, and whatever promises various YouTube, YouTube pundits and online armchair warriors might make, that seems to me to be best advice. It's clear that we must have been tricked, conned, duped into incarnating into this reality. Because if the terms and conditions had been made clear to us on a soul spirit level before we came in, honestly, really, which of us would have said, yeah, I'm up for undergoing a life full of hardship and suffering and pain and turmoil. I'm up for witnessing all these horrors. I'm up for being a part of that. Why would I want to stay here in the spirit realm when I could go down there and experience all that stuff? 
Again, people will say that it's all part of the lessons that our souls yearn to learn so that they can take them back to source with them. And again, my response to that would be, why then is this place so unfairly weighted in the favour of suffering, hardship and all the rest of it and against joy, happiness and abundance? No, we were tricked. Whatever method was used, none of us would have voluntarily agreed to have come in here to undergo all this stuff. It's the same reason why the so-called elites, the psychopaths, the sick ones, feel the need to pre-announce their dastardly plans for us. So they put it in movies, TV shows, music videos, things of this nature. Sometimes they just come right out and announce what they've got planned for us. They do it in the form of documents, of books, uh, in the form of speeches that politicians might make. They just come right out and say what they plan to do. There's been more and more of that in recent times. They've been getting more blatant and more brazen about it. And people just don't seem to notice. They don't seem to care. In the words of George Carlin, they can come right out and say, this is the future we've got planned for you and your family. And most people just won't give a shit because they're not paying attention. Their attention spans have been reduced to about five seconds due to social media and stuff on the Internet and uh, the plethora of things that are battling for our attention and our consciousness in these times. Or they'll just be too cowardly to want to do anything about it. Or they'll just feel too hopeless to be able to do anything about it. So they're telling us where they want to take things. But they usually try and trick and coerce us into agreeing to these things by dressing them up as something that they're not. So they won't tell you, for example, that you should take a three dart finish arm spear because it's part of a worldwide eugenics depopulation agenda. No, they'll tell you that it's for your own good, your own safety, the safety of those around you, and it's your civic duty to uh, take one of these things, or preferably several of these things. They won't tell you really what the agenda is. Then they'll go on and on about this uh, global climate warming change bollocks, as the sheep farm lads would say. And they'll say, oh, you need to modify your lifestyle and travel less and uh, rack up these carbon neutral points and uh, offset your carbon emissions and all this sort of stuff because it's to protect the planet, don't you know? That's why we're doing it. Because we care. Not because we're psychopaths. Not because we want to control and subjugate everyone. No, we care about all living things and the planet itself, they will say. They won't tell you that it's part of some much wider agenda tying into the New World Order Master Plan, Agenda 2030, the smart grid, internet of things, futuristic 5G, transhumanist nightmare. They won't come out and tell you that. They have to do everything by trickery and by coercion and deception. So therefore, they're not really gaining your consent, are they? If they're not being completely upfront about what they plan to do. And I feel it would have been that way when we were tricked and coerced through whatever methods were used into incarnating into this place. We must have been conned and mugged off in some way to have found ourselves here. Many describe us as original divine sparks who have somehow found ourselves in this bastardized CGI fake virtual reality simulation world which for some reason we are inhabiting. But I would argue that it must have been achieved through deception and duplicity. So the advice that I gave earlier is the best advice that I feel can be given to anyone in these times, if we're going to try and make any sense of these lives. And I feel that with every passing video, I'm making more and more sense of this reality in which we all find ourselves. The old answers that used to get given to me just don't cut it anymore. The new answers that I'm coming across, and I intend to have many more conversations of this nature in the months ahead, are making a whole lot more sense of this crazy, fucked up world, which I like to describe as a Monty Python sketch gone live, because that's how ridiculous 
and absurd it truly is. At this point, I want to include an excerpt from a BBC Prime Time TV series, which used to run several years ago. I know, in the same video, I've included a clip of Stephen Fry and a BBC One Prime Time TV series. Have I lost my mind? No, it's because so often you get the truth of a matter placed in plain sight, as I was just saying, and TV shows can be a great way of discovering great truths. So there was this show which ran many years ago, which was the sequel to a previous series. The original series was called Life on Mars. It ran, I think, around about 2007, 2008, those sort of times on BBC One. And then there was a show called Ashes to Ashes, which ran for three series, around about 2009, 2010, I think it was, which was the follow-up. On the surface, it was a procedural crime cop drama, full of period detail set initially in the 1970s with Life on Mars, and then the early 80s with Ashes to Ashes. But if you can strip away that exoteric surface narrative, you would find many coded elements and a lot of truth lying right there in the storyline. And a lot was revealed to us in the very final episode of Ashes to Ashes. What we come to discover is that the world, spoiler alert, by the way, if you've never seen the show and you ever intend to watch it, but we find that the world that is inhabited by all these cop characters is actually some sort of purgatory or some sort of middle holding ground between the real world, whatever that even is anymore, and whatever lies beyond. So it's a realm which has been created for these characters to work out their issues, to get some shit off their chest spiritually, to deal with some shadow work that they need to do before they can move on. Uh, spiritually speaking. So in other words, the realm which they think is real, full of police stations and uh, cars and streets and buildings and people, is illusory. It's being created for them. They believe it to be real while they're living through it, but in this final episode, they come to discover the true illusory nature of it. So here's the key scene from that, which breaks it all down. And obviously, if you're watching this video on YouTube, then you won't have just seen that clip because it would have got this video taken down on copyright grounds. But if you're viewing this on BitChute, Odyssey, Rumble or any other platform, then you would have seen it. And I feel it tells us so much. So Daniel Mays's character there is implied to be the devil or Satan or you know, whatever name you want to put on that entity. And he's revealing to these characters, first of all, the fact that they're dead. They think they're fully living in the real world. What they don't realise is that they've actually passed on and they're now in this illusory reality, which seems so real to them. So he rips the roof off the police station there and reveals the starlit sky above and says, isn't it beautiful? And then he says, Oh, come on. You didn't think this was a real police station, did you? Because it had been made so convincing and so believable that that's exactly what the characters had perceived it to be. So some great truth there in that clip and some food for thought to ponder on, I would argue. Right, at this point, I want to step to my virtual mailbag and get into some correspondence. This has been a feature of these videos. Uh, because a lot of people that have been watching the previous ones have had some really great observations to make and chipped in with some really relevant comments. So with each new volume that I do, I like to read a few of these out. So these are people that have either emailed in or they've left comments below one of the previous videos. I'm leaving out the names as always, so no identities here. I'm just going to read out the comments. So let's get into this one. So the first one this time around reads, I'm very glad you've gone in the direction of the nature of reality as it's all I'm interested in anymore. I'm getting that way. 
I'm watching a lot of Forever Conscious uh, Research Channel 2, and some of them are the most informative videos I've ever seen, particularly the ones about Robert Munro. I'm afraid I have to conclude it's all about Lush. I had a stark realisation the other day that we are not here for our own benefit. We are livestock, and as such, the diabolical farmers feel entitled to own us. We're told we have inherent freedom and rights, but that is a big fat lie like everything else. Nevertheless, I'm determined to make the best life I can for myself within the Matrix, despite the never-ending obstacles. Remember when Morpheus says in the Matrix that whole crops were lost when they made life too easy in the simulation. I think that meant that people were too happy and the farmers weren't getting the misery-flavoured louche that they love, sick mofos that they are. They binned the crop. There's definitely some symbolism there. On to the next one. When I look at my 63 years of life, there is a pattern. It looks like I'm running on some kind of computer program with some minor deviation depending on the environment, computer program ifs. But in the essence, it's always the same. So I figured I cannot change much. My journey down the rabbit hole is continuing. Will I find out how to escape this reincarnation and never come back to this hell? Well, every program has some kind of bug and I intend to find it. It's taken me a while to find you, Eric Dubay and Howdy McCoskey and many others, but I did and was so glad to realise that I'm not the only one thinking like this. Finally. And another movie analogy has just come into my mind at this point. The final scenes in They Live, John Carpenter's now cult classic with Rowdy Roddy Piper. And uh, right at the end of it, the central characters find that they have to hack into the broadcast system, which has been putting out this fake illusory version of reality, which the masses have been buying and believing in. And the two main characters lose their lives in the process of hacking into this broadcast and finally destroying uh, the system that is putting it out there. But in so doing, their sacrifice ends the illusion that everyone is living under. And the truth of what that reality is, is laid bare for all to see in no uncertain terms. And again, there's some allegorical value to that scene as well. None of these movies get put out there by accident. There's a reason for all of these different narratives, because they're telling us something that we need to comprehend about where we really are and what we really are. Somebody else has written in, question, what is the point? Answer, there is none. If you don't care, it doesn't matter. It's not nihilism. Hence, absolute freedom. And I think only the Buddha, if he existed, worked this out when he stated the only possible conclusion is to avoid suffering. He said, don't look for God or the causation or what the ultimate answers lie. This is a fool's errand. The I don't give a shit means I literally didn't ask to be here. It's shite. People are wankers. So fuck it. I will be me and have absolutely no interest in what other people say or do. Not in a psychopathic way, but in a leave me alone sort of way. The fact that life is so pointless means it's so liberating. Fuck it. I really am happy because people are scum and not worth trying to impress. Works for me, honestly. So that's what this guy said, making the point that ultimately trying to find any kind of meaning in these lives 
is pointless is an exercise in futility because we've been trapped and tricked and coerced into being here and we just have to make the best of it. I would only add to what he had to say there that uh, to reinforce my earlier point, we must do all we can to try and help others and try and make this world a better place, recognising that we're never going to fix it totally, but we can leave it in a better condition than it would have been in if we'd never incarnated into it. If there is meaning in these lives, that, I think, is where it lies. And I responded to that comment by saying, I can get with some of that. All I've ever wanted is to be left the fuck alone. If everyone would leave me alone to do what I want, I'll do no harm to no other living sentient being. Not intentionally, anyway. I'm at my very happiest when I'm by myself out in nature. But we're never left alone to live like that, are we? And there's the problem. They don't leave us alone. They keep pushing and prodding and poking at us to try and generate a reaction. The final one that I'll read out pretty much ties into the earlier Stephen Fry comment, and I'm still pinching myself to believe that I actually included uh, some content from Stephen Fry, but, you know, it is what it is. So this guy, a friend of mine, has written in to say, rats, why? Just why? Birds of prey, how wonderful they are to watch defying gravity, lol, soaring overhead. But what are they actually doing? They're looking for unsuspecting mammals to kill from above, inserting their death-shaped claws into fleshy bodies, tearing through the rectum or the eye or the lung as they do so, ripping them from their family before eating them alive. Again, why? At least maggots eat dead flesh. And the answer to rats is not to feed birds of prey. So as anyone who's seen my previous videos will know, this is one of my major contentions. If this place were the creation of a loving, benevolent God, why is it necessary for living, sentient creatures to have to rip each other apart in painful, horrific, fearful ways every single day just in order to survive? What does it say about any kind of entity any kind of consciousness that would have created a reality in which that is necessary when there are so many different ways in which this realm could have been constructed. It never had to be that way. It could have been so different. The fact that it is that way means that it was set up that way deliberately. This video will have offended those of various religious constitutions. It will have pissed people off. It will have disappointed people. Whatever the case, I really don't care. I'm saying exactly what I want to say on these platforms, which are my platforms where I'm free to express myself in any way that I choose. I know that these messages are resonating with a whole load of people because I get a lot of of positive feedback and uh, people telling me that they're finding a lot of value in these messages. So for anyone for whom these, these messages are not resonating, you do, of course, always have the choice to jog on to a channel and a speaker who is going to be more in keeping with your way of viewing the world. If you don't like what I'm doing, don't watch my videos. Don't come to my channel. I'm not interested in reading comments from people who are going to challenge the points that I'm putting across. Not interested in that. I've heard it a million times already. You would be best served going along to some broadcaster who fits your viewpoint far more so than I do. Or better yet, how about you start your own channel? How about you set up your own platforms where you showing your own face, not using virtual AI voice uh, overlays, not hiding behind a pseudonym or a login name, express the way you feel about the world in no uncertain terms. And then 
I think I might come along to your channel and take a look at what you're saying and cast my critical eye over it. Maybe offer a few little pointers and a few little observations myself in the comments section of your platform. How does that sound? Sounds pretty good to me. For everyone else who has been finding value in these videos, I hope that you'll continue to do so. I do intend to have many more conversations of this nature. I've got some interesting guests lined up for the months ahead. And this is a subject area which I intend to continue pursuing now on these regular video updates. As well as these, my content looking into the true nature of the music industry and how popular culture and entertainment has been weaponized will of course continue. That is my core work. Most of the public talks that I do get into uh, this kind of information. And of course my books do, and many of the interviews that I do where I jump on other hosts' shows get into aspects of this as well. So the one-stop shop to get access to all my videos and my interviews, books, and everything else that I've done is djmarkdevlin.com. On that site, you'll find an events page where you can find out what conferences and meetup groups and events I'm going to be speaking at in the coming weeks and months. Over the summer, I've got a few events where I'm going to be DJing, simply just dropping some tunes and trying to give people a good time and uh, just have a bit of fun for a change for an hour or two. So you can find out where those events are going to be happening. And everything else is just on that one-stop shop website, DJ markdevlin.com. I have my video channels on YouTube, Odyssey, BitChute and Rumble. You're probably watching this on one of them, so be aware that these other channels also exist. I've recently resurrected my Instagram, so I'm posting up on there for anyone that's up on the IG. I do have a TikTok platform, which uh, my friend Sheena is running for me, and she's posting up some of my video clips on there. The intention being to grab uh, the consciousness of younger people who hang out on TikTok and direct them towards my real work, some of these longer videos, if their attention spans will last, and uh, getting them to pay attention to some of these. But TikTok being a good way of hooking in, hopefully, some younger people to these subjects. What else is going on? Got my Patreon. Uh, that is a good way of supporting the continuation of my work for anyone that's found value in it. So it's entirely voluntary, of course, but if you wish to become a Patreon supporter for as little as $10 a month, what is that? A sandwich and a cup of coffee, I guess, which people would spend in their lunch break and not give it a second thought. So for that, you can become a Patreon supporter and you get access to at least three exclusive videos every month, which I don't post elsewhere. Big thanks to everyone who has supported my Patreon so far. It's definitely appreciated and it does help to ensure the continuation of this work because, of course, we all have operating costs to meet content creators just as much as anyone else. A couple of natural health products that I've got involved with. There's Masterpiece and Nano Soma. I'm going to put links to each of these in the notes below to where you can access websites giving further information on how these products are designed to fire up your natural immune systems, help you to detoxify from various uh, things that you may have taken into your body because of all the assaults that are taking place against us in these times, and generally just improve your natural holistic health. So anyone that wants to order these products, if you do so through the links that will be in the notes below, that benefits me also and uh, just contributes a little bit more towards me being able to continue this work. So anyone that wants to get involved in those, your support is also greatly appreciated. If anyone just wants to make a straight donation, you can do so via my buymeacoffee.com page. Links to that in the notes below as well. But in all honesty, it makes the most sense to become a Patreon supporter if you can, because then you get recurring exclusive content delivered every month. That's pretty much all I want to say this time around. Uh, people will make of the message in this video what they will. It will resonate with who it's meant to resonate with, and it will fall on deaf ears with everyone else. It is what it is. I didn't create this realm. I'm doing my best to navigate my way through it. And if I can help others along that journey, along that path, then I'm very happy to do so. 
See you next time. Cheers.